Well, good morning, everyone, um, for this uh, circle session. Um, we have a keynote speaker uh, from, from Sri Lanka uh, to talk on the topic uh, research to policy in the global south. Uh, it is with the great pleasure that we uh, welcome Dr. Rohan Samarajiva. And I would like to give a brief background uh, of the, Dr. Samarajiva. He's a founding chair of the LIRNE Asia, which is a policy think tank in, in Sri Lanka, where they try to bring about policy change through research and science to, for the betterment of rural livelihoods and, and common lives in Sri Lanka. Uh, he's, he's a member of the United Nations Global Pulse Advisory Group on the governance of data and artificial intelligence. He served as the chair of the Apex Information and Communication Technology Agency within the government of Sri Lanka from 2018 to 2019. Uh, he was uh, director general of telecommunications Sri Lanka from 1998 to 1999, and an associate professor of communication and public policy at Ohio State University from 1987 to 2000. Um, and it is a great pleasure, Dr. Samarajiva, uh, for your kind time to come to this uh, workshop or conference uh, to give a presentation. Um, and my my name, uh, as I say, is, is displayed Naresh Thevadasan. I was a former associate professor in the School of Environmental Sciences. Uh, my research uh, mainly focuses on, on, on tree integration into agricultural ecosystems to bring about environment, economic, ecological, and social benefits. And uh, so again, I'm we also I, we, I, I also try hard to bring about policy change in the agriculture sector. Uh, we are try to influence provincial and federal government to to enhance this type of land use systems as a climate resilient land use systems, so that uh, common landowners uh, uh, can benefit uh, out of the tree integration. So without any further ado, it is our great pleasure, Dr. Samarajiva. Uh, and we would welcome you to give your keynote speak, please. Uh, thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Uh, perhaps uh, there are other time zones involved. In that case, good day. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Yep. Okay. Um, I was thinking when I was invited uh, to, to talk to you all, uh, what I would have been interested in as a graduate student when I was studying uh, in Canada uh, about 40 years ago, I was at Simon Fraser. Um, so I was thinking, you know, what could have sort of made it uh, more interesting for me to participate in as a graduate student because there are the substantive subject areas that one is dealing with. And then there's sort of the larger issues. And I see from the program that uh, you're looking at sort of more the process aspects of uh, uh, being a graduate student and, and, and being at this stage of your life. Um, so um, let me begin. Uh, hopefully, I will say a few things that are of interest and um, oops, okay. Um, First is, um, I'm hoping that people, I, I don't say who was the uh, author of this. Uh, this is on a uh, gravestone uh, in a cemetery in London. Uh, uh, Professor Samaji, uh, yes. Uh, could you put your slides on the presentation mode? Oh, sorry. Okay, good. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I don't say who's the author of this, who wrote this, uh, but uh, I hope uh, there's always Google. You can easily find out who wrote this. Um, there is a distinction in uh, the university between uh, basic uh, science and applied science. Um, I have always found that I've been on the applied side. Uh, but even basic, I find, is um, has got uh, extraordinary applications in the world, and does contribute to changing it. So, um, without getting into all those esoteric discussions, 
let's just leave it at this, that this whole business is about, uh, that I'm talking about, and that many of you will be called upon to uh, take your knowledge to the world, to effect changes or to prevent bad changes from happening. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll take that as an assumption, right? So that is what the whole research to policy is. Research not as an end in itself, but research as something that uh, contributes to uh, how, a, how policies are made and how people are governed and things of that nature. So may, I assume most of you, all of you are connected to universities in one form or another. Um, should universities as such as, as, as organizations be engaged in this activity? Uh, I'd like to say no, uh, because supplying evidence to policy is not a neutral activity. Um, I've been on the gun sites of several, there was a time when uh, I think it was Ohio Bell, which was the company at that time, the larger entity was Ameritech. Nobody knows these names, these companies no longer exist. Uh, but there was somebody from that organization who uh, actually threatened to deport me when I was teaching at Ohio State. And my question was across the Ohio River. Uh, because that was the end of their remit, the end of their, their jurisdiction. Um, uh, so I, I got a nice dinner with the university president uh, in this relation. Uh, but other than that, uh, nothing much happened to me because academic freedom is, uh, may, there may be some problems with it, but it's actually uh, alive and well. So the whole issue was that while I was saying controversial things as a university academic, uh, and I was annoying uh, the incumbent telephone company in Ohio, uh, Ohio State University wasn't. Um, and Ohio State University could continue to do whatever it was doing and, and so on. Now, there, is, uh, there are some areas where, you know, higher education funding and so on, where universities employ lobbies and try to influence higher education policy, higher education funding policy and so on. I am cautious about that. I think people should not uh, be self-serving. But so the, the, the point of the story is that while universities should remain neutral, they should create an environment where there'll be individual policy members like me um, who have policy relevant research findings and who have the desire to, to take that to, to the public policy process to give them the freedom uh, to create the conditions for them to, to do that. Uh, that would be the, the contribution of the universities. Um, now we we'll move to uh, universities in the global south. Uh, again, I think, you know, in some form, uh, my, this audience has an interest in that. Um, there'll be people like me who studied in Canada and within a week of uh, doing my defense was back in Sri Lanka. Uh, and then of course, back and forth, but uh, back in Sri Lanka again. And there'll be others who uh, might continue in Canada uh, or wherever they're studying, but do some things in the Global South with Global South universities. Uh, this is something that um, you'll have to deal with these universities at some point. Um, I'm sure Sharada and uh, uh, Professor Tevadasan deal with uh, Global South universities. So you know what the situation there is. Uh, there's a strong, strong uh, high demand of time for teaching, in-class teaching. Uh, 14 to 16 hours is uh, the number that I got. Uh, and I don't think I ever did 14 to 16 hours when I was teaching at Ohio State. Um, there is, these days, uh, universities are very keen about ISI journals and so on. So uh, applied research doesn't get, uh, isn't easily publishable in ISI journals. 
so that also tends to be a bit of a problem for those who actually do uh, research and want to get published. Um, and then, you know, uh, the communication capabilities, competencies of people in the university and the skills that are needed for, um, for uh, policy communication are not the same. Um, so as a result, even in developed country universities, the problem has been recognized, the last problem in particular, the communication competencies problem. So you have entities like this, um, LSC Public Policy Group, that essentially serves as a kind of a broker uh, within the university for taking uh, university research uh, out to the public policy process. Now, you must remember that in the UK, I don't know what the situation is in Canada. Uh, in the UK, uh, the university ranking comparison thing, which uh, scheme that they have, which sort of translates into, into funding at some point from the Grants Commission, uh, actually gave way to how much one contributed to the public policy process. So uh, in order to, because of that overall incentive that the university had, uh, they have created things like this. Now, this is not the case in the universities that I interact with uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. They basically are on their own. Now, of course, there's another animal uh, that takes research to uh, the public policy process that is think tanks um, of the kind that I set up in 2004 in Sri Lanka. Uh, their reason for existence is policy influence. I mean, if we can't show policy influence, I don't think we will get money on a continuing basis. So we got to show that we are having an impact. Uh, they have the advantage of focus and specialization. Uh, they are not doing everything under the sun. And we tend to attract people who are motivated, who have the attitude. Um, but of course, we also have another problem, which is that we, I, I mean, I sometimes am annoyed by how easily, you know, people who want to set up committees in government, et cetera, they say, oh, we just get somebody from X, Y, Z universities, preferably the one that I went to, says the, the bureaucrat. Uh, there's no thought given to the good work being done in uh, various think tanks, because there is this question of legitimacy. You know, are they are they legit? Are they taking money from foreign sources? I think you know that some of you may have heard that there's this huge crackdown on uh, foreign funding being reserved, uh, received by Indian uh, think tanks and research organizations. So there's uh, there are those issues. Um, and uh, universities actually don't uh, produce people trained to take research to policy. So a lot of think tanks are continually uh, retraining people, reskilling them and so on. So you could say there's a bit of a problem. There's a lot of good knowledge in the universities and there's a need for knowledge in the public policy process. Uh, in the public policy institutions, um, but there's a gap. So how do we fill the gap? Um, instead of talking abstractly, I thought I'll, I'll share with you an example of what we've done. I'm not talking about my organization, which is a very highly focused organization. And we can talk about that during the discussion, which, uh, which has had significant uh, public policy impact, uh, but that's because we, we actually put money into it and resources into it and so on. I'm talking about something that was a much uh, less hands-on uh, and I would say a very uh, low cost kind of activity, uh, which was a Asia-Africa network of academics and uh, reflective practitioners uh, within government and industry. What I mean by this, I cooked up this word, by the way. Uh, I don't know anybody else who uses it. It means that there are people in these organizations within government and industry who just uh, like to think about what they're doing, like to reflect on it and like to 
learn more about what they're doing. Uh, somewhat in, 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 in even in abstract uh, conceptual knowledge related to what they're doing. Uh, that's a subset, but it's an interesting and useful subset. Uh, and then people are working in think tanks. So um, we created something called Communication Policy Research South. Um, this was focused on ICT issues, uh, information and communication technology issues. Uh, one of the key elements was a two uh, to two and a half day uh, intense academy uh, of how to become effective policy intellectuals. Recall what I said about people not being trained in the university. So we are saying, okay, this is how the public policy process works. This is the kind of communication that works in the public policy process and so on, uh, with a lot of examples and exercises and presentation, uh, uh, participatory presentations, teamwork and so on. Uh, when I, we had a bit of money, I actually had uh, one of my former colleagues uh, from Ohio State uh, look over the presentations that they would make um, on uh, YouTube. Uh, she would get them to send the YouTube presentations and would comment about how they were speaking and their time management and things of that nature. Uh, and just had one on one coaching on effective presentation. Uh, oral presentation also was provided, but we ran out of money and I had to discontinue that. Um, but uh, they got a lot of feedback from senior uh, scholars, senior people who were involved in uh, talking to governments and influencing policy. Um, so there is this training activity. And then immediately following that is a conference where you'd have people who have come through some form of competitive process. Uh, who are presenting formal papers, like in a normal academic conference, except they're all policy oriented. Everybody has to make, have policy recommendations as part of their presentations. So the young people who are in the uh, academy are now observing this, uh, talking to the people who've done it, uh, people who have done the presentations, and then they would ideally come back uh, at a subsequent conference uh, and make their own presentations. I'll show you some numbers that this actually happened. Uh, we also put some resources in through questionnaires and tracking uh, studies and so on to find out what people did in between. Uh, and we asked, uh, you know, did you influence policy? Did you try? What kind of results did you get? Uh, did you also publish uh, your research, et cetera? So uh, here are a few uh, success stories. Um, and you can, I think you can, uh, in this day and age, you know, I have this uh, thing which says, uh, I don't know whether you guys remember Bishop Berkeley saying, uh, if a tree falls in the forest uh, and nobody hears it, does it actually fall? Uh, what I say these days is, if you're an intellectual and you're not visible on the internet, do you really exist? Uh, so you should be able to check these people's names out. Um, Grace Mirandia Santos uh, in the Philippines, she drove the broadband quality debate. And I was actually intrigued that I came to the US this time for uh, the, the main uh, telecom policy research conference called TPRC. And they're talking about broadband quality now. Uh, Grace and Lernesia backing her, we were talking about it maybe 10 years ago or even more. Uh, she shaped that debate, uh, got standards implemented and so on, and <clears throat> made some very significant contributions on competition about introducing competition in the Philippines telecom sector. You can find out, you can just search her name and things should come up. Ibrahim Rahman um, uh, from Indonesia, he had a PhD from Sweden. Now Grace, by the way, doesn't even have a PhD, right? Uh, when she started on this, she was, I think, only an undergrad. And while over the last uh, 15 years, she got herself a master's in public policy, uh, part-time, while, uh, you know, supporting herself and her family, uh, doing all these consulting kinds of things. Uh, Ibrahim got a PhD from Sweden, came back. Uh, he has a tendency to contribute op-ed articles, uh, 
ministers in Indonesia listened to the guy. Uh, Ibrahim and uh, Aisha Zainuddin, one of my colleagues. Now, Ibrahim doesn't actually get rewarded in money. Now, Aisha is part of her job. Uh, is uh, getting research out. Uh, so when um, uh, Indonesia sought to ban Facebook uh, in 2018, the two of them got together. Ayesha had research uh, survey data and things like that. Ibrahim had the name and the recognition. The two of them got together and published uh, an op-ed. Uh, shortly thereafter, the ministry announced that they would not block Facebook. Uh, Yudanje Vijayaratna is a very interesting guy. Uh, he just came to CPR South. Uh, he being from Sri Lanka, then he applied to work with uh, LearnAsia, worked on our data analytics team, uh, and is now uh, the founder of a, a fact-checking organization in Sri Lanka. So, you know, you can see from uh, one of our surveys, uh, if anyone is interested, I can make available some of the uh, papers that have this data in more detail, you can see that, uh, so we distinguish between those who presented papers, that is the senior people, and the young scholars, and the young scholars who came back a second time, that is, who came for one event as a young scholar, then came back as a paper presenter. So from that second cat that category where they have repeated interactions, only 4%, only 4% were inactive. 96% were doing both research and policy interventions. Um, young scholars, uh, those who just come for the training, uh, again, not bad, 73% of them had done research and policy. 17% of them had uh, been active in terms of research. These were some of the tracking studies that we did. So my argument is that this kind of activity, I mean, again, I, I said it's relatively uh, cheap, uh, but actually it's not because we ran out of money. Uh, IDRC in Canada was funding this for maybe 13, 14 years from 2006 to 2018. Uh, and then, you know, the funding stopped. So we also stopped. Uh, one reason why the costs were high was that uh, there was great, in, I, I tried to keep it to Asia only, but there was a huge demand from Africa and encouragement that we do it in Africa. And then we brought the two regions together uh, about halfway through the process by about the sixth conference. And then it got costly because you, know, you got to move people back and around. One conference in Asia where we bring the Africans there, and then another conference in, in Africa where we take the Asians there and so on. So one way of reducing the costs is, is taking smaller units. I, I, I tried very hard to do something for ASEAN, um, Southern Africa, and so on. You know, you could save some money, but there is some value in, uh, in uh, learning from each other and cross-national learning. But anyway, that's a different question we can get into. Uh, what this can do is that it will leverage uh, what people are doing in a very, so people are doing what they're doing in think tanks, in, uh, in university and so on. But this kind of takes that subset of people who are motivated to change the world and helps it sort of leverage it. You're, you're, you're working on, they've got a lot of other research. We don't, give any money in CPR South to anybody to do any research. Uh, there's no formal mentorship programs. It's you know, really up to them. If they manage to get hold of some senior person and convince them to read their papers uh, through the informal networking, you know, talking over coffee or whatever, that was up to them. We didn't formalize those things. Uh, this would also support and encourage policy-oriented faculty within universities. It's extremely rewarding. Uh, people were, were bothering me to, to get on the board and come to these conferences, people who are in the universities. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, you know, assist universities to produce graduates who are better equipped to take research to policy. So I think I have stayed at about 20 minutes. Uh, 
I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Samarajiva, for your in-depth analysis on how effectively we can bring policy change from the university by involving a think tank, uh, as well as young uh, scholars uh, who can be effective in bringing about change. Um, I would like to, I have some questions, but I don't want to ask them now. I would like to open it to the audience to ask some questions, and then I will follow up with my questions. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, just to uh, just to break guys and keep things uh, going. Um, I mean, I think this is this is an absolutely fascinating, um, and and I'm I'm very glad uh, you did what you did, Rohan, because I've just submitted a grant application. And I think the, the one actor that's missing in, in all of this uh, are donors themselves. Um, IDRC is slightly different um, in the way they operate, uh, you know, their mission and everything else. But typically, um, uh, you know, uh, donors that fund university research off late, especially in the last 20 odd years, uh, I think expect that the research that you do actually influence policy. And I'm not sure academics are really equipped to doing that. So I go back to your earlier uh, slide, you know, the, the second or the third, you know, should, should academic researchers be doing the sort of policy stuff, you know, that, that uh, slide. And, and while I think as a researcher, I want my research and the sort of research I do to benefit and to influence issues on the ground, um, I don't know if academic researchers are, are, especially in the social sciences, are we really, do we have the skills to do that kind of, uh, you know, influencing and impacting a uh, policy? And how do we go about, what sort of skills? I mean, you you articulated some of the things that, that you did in this uh, project. But what do you do with people who are already in universities? And I'm talking about universities in Canada. And so I'm not even talking about universities in, uh, in India or uh, other parts of South Asia. So maybe uh, some thoughts on that would be very helpful. And, 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 be careful what you say. We might rope you into doing some things. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I've done things like this. Uh, so, for example, uh, there's some kind of uh, refresher courses that the University Grants Commission in India has people to go through to get their promotions or whatever. And uh, Jamia Milia asked me to come and do a workshop for these young faculty, uh, which I was very happy to do. Um, my point is, well, let me, let me put it this way. Um, you know, uh, I was, uh, when I was teaching at Ohio State, I, I was talking to some of the fundraising guys and I said, hey, you know, I mean, can you raise some, how do you do this business? They said, look, we open the doors, but you guys have to come in and close the deal, right? That the, the person who's handing over, you know, X amount of dollars, X million to Ohio State. They want to see the researcher. They want to see the, the university faculty who will be in charge before the thing is closed. So in the same way, for the public policy process also, you, know, you can't completely outsource it. The university faculty have to be involved in this activity because that's where the credibility of the information comes in. So what the public policy units can do is sort of create help them to write the op-eds, uh, help them to write the policy briefs and so on, uh, help them to, to, to you know, deal with television cameras better than they normally do and things of that nature. And that's the kind of thing that I think without having a specialized unit, if you have a network like this, even within Canada or you know, within people doing South Asia studies or you know, some, some definition, uh, that can be developed. Um, that is so. So that is 
it's not like we outsource it uh, or we say that university faculty are incapable. What I'm saying is there's a subset of faculty. You know, uh, one of the things that I was sort of disappointed by when I uh, started teaching uh, on the tenure track at Ohio State, he said there weren't enough weird and unusual people in the university. Uh, you know, at Simon Fraser, there was one of my professors, uh, Tony Bilden, uh, who uh, was extraordinarily eccentric. Uh, I mean, right against his name on the faculty directory, it said, do not call before 4 p.m. The guy just, you know, he was a night bird. He just functioned only in the night. Uh, and I was at a, sitting behind him at a defense. And I think I must have smoked several cigarettes, you know, like three cigarettes, just from secondary smoke inhalation. The guy was a maniac, but he was brilliant, right? Um, he was he couldn't be put in a public policy context. He was a pure intellectual, right? Uh, but you know, more and more we have become corporatized. So many of us can do all these things. But anyway, what I think is it's a subset, uh, not everybody, but a subset. And that subset has to be equipped. And what I think is that can, this kind of network can do that at a effectively and at a low cost. I hope I've answered your question. Uh, can I do a follow-up question, Naresh? Sure, sure. There's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not totally related to what you're saying, but it's, it's kind of related. You know, one of the things about, uh, you know, what we do with policy is, as researchers, we are told, you know, you have to write for the policy audience. So not the sort of dense prose that, that we keep writing. Uh, and then we have to do these elevator pitches. So you ran into the president of your country. It, to you had two seconds, what would you tell them? And, you know, these sorts of things. But a lot of work that we do, especially with all this emphasis on lived experiences and lived realities, the devil is really in the details. So how do you get policy folks to, to actually spend time and uh, reflect on the details, which they can then use to shape policy. Well, uh, uh, you mentioned elevator pitches. That's something we used to do in the Young Scholars Academy. Uh, I used to be the grumpy old policymaker. And... Uh, I would be walking around the room and they had to come and sort of get my attention and do an elevator pitch. And I say, okay, now we are sixth floor. I'm out of here. <laughs> so, uh, no, uh, but the bottom line is you see attention is the most valuable and the most scarce commodity. That's something we have to understand. Attention is the most valuable and, and scarce commodity today, not information, attention. So if that is the case, and remember, I have been in the university and I have been, I've been a regulator, I've been a policy guy, I've been a policy intellectual, throwing things at people from the outside. You know, I've sort of played all sides of this game. You've got to get people's attention. There, there, there are a lot of people trying to get their attention. You know, the most difficult thing is to get a meeting with the prime minister or the, or the president. That's the most valuable thing. Right. When you get it, if you can't get your point across in the first two minutes, game is over. So the whole point is, I mean, I like I tell people to read to, to think of newspaper articles, the way the newspaper articles are structured. They're not written the way we write academic papers. The first paragraph must convince you to keep reading. So in our case, we start with the background, the literature search, blah, 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 blah. And the, we get to the point at the end, right? So I think th those things, uh, I think what you need to do is you have to do in-depth research in order to do a tight policy brief or even a tight presentation. You really have to have spent a lot of time on it. It's yeah. only with that depth of understanding that you can write that tight thing and what we tend to do is we tend to do the present the conversation across the desk, leave a policy brief, and at the bottom of the policy brief says, if you want to read the report, here's the report, etc. The internet really is very helpful, conveniently getting people to get into more detail and more detail. And you know, I'm 
I've been surprised by how many uh, people in the academy, uh, in uh, public policy, senior people in the Indian uh, uh, civil service and so on, who keep asking me, okay, so what is that research about? What is your sample size? What is your confidence uh, interval? You know, they, they want detail. So then you want detail, I'll give you detail. But I'm not giving you detail in that first five minutes. Let me interrupt here, and then there's a question from Dilshan. Dilshan, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to ask a boring, naive PhD question. So um, you, you, you keep mentioning policy contribution. How is policy different from, let's say, problem-oriented research? You know, every research has to introduce a problem. How is it different? Are we talking about influencing the bureaucrats? Uh, and how is it different from writing a one page at the end of your PhD thesis about policy implications? Uh, is it about asking the research questions themselves in a different way? Policy and problem oriented, I don't see a big distinction. Um, perhaps there is that I'm missing. Um, uh, policy briefs can be given to um, to company guys, anybody who has the ability, who is in a position to do something about some problem, right? So for example, I can remember, well, let's not, I mean, I've done so many things for phone companies. Um, you know, how about what activating their disaster uh, warning systems, uh, about being uh, about designing packages for uh, persons with disabilities. I've done endless numbers for private sector companies, but even say other say big social service or community based organizations. I can remember one of the things that we did uh, with uh, Sarode, which is Sri Lanka's largest uh, community based organization after the tsunami was that we got them to think about disasters differently. I think, I mean, not, I'm not talking about this, you know, here's a particular thing that you're doing and change that. I'm saying we got them to think about it differently, which is they were saying, okay, disasters happen. We pack our lorries and we go and help them. I said, no, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you develop preparedness in the communities? How do you get people ready to minimize the damage? And they actually shifted gears. They actually had a sort of a strategy session. And they said, now from this point, we are going to think about disasters differently, right? Uh, so um, I, I don't think it's this sort of very narrow. Uh, we use uh, a structure by Lindquist, who may actually be a Canadian scholar, if I recall correctly. If anybody wants any references, we can provide them. Uh, that's also to Sharada. You know, I don't give these footnotes and references endlessly uh, because I'm now more or less in the policy world. But in the academic world, you've got to keep flagging, oh, I read the literature, I know this stuff, right? I think this is uh, Lindquist who did it, um, who talks about three different kinds of uh, policy influence. One is the simple form where you, you know, there's somebody trying to raise a tax and you knock it off or modify it easy. Second one is you get them to ask different questions. Third one is that you, you ensure that the bureaucrats, the decision makers uh, themselves change, and then you are no longer needed. And that's really, I think, the most powerful aspect of what we can do. Thank you, Dr. Samarajiva. There's another question from Ataharul. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Samariva, for enlightening presentation. Um, uh, it draws my attention about your, your suggestion about attention. Um, I think we're living in an attention economy. And uh, that, that makes me to think about that policy and politics is directly related. And um, especially uh, now the, the days that we are living right now, I mean, science is not the only uh, mechanism to create our shared reality, right? Um, so the knowledge we produce, the knowledge we disseminate 
you know, there are many other aspects of it, like uh, geopolitical issues or, you know, cultural issues, national political issues. So my question is that, do you think that policy and politics is related? And number two is like, you know, I am, even within the academia, if you're not involved in some kind of power relation and politics, you could be doing very nice research, uh, but it doesn't get through and doesn't recognize or even, you know, like in your own scholarly community, you're sometime let alone forget about the, you know, uh, policy or practice. Um, uh, so what, how, what is your suggestion like for, you know, there are people like, like, I'm not really, I, I feel like I just like to research. I'm not much involved in those kind of, you know, um, thing that we need to do, like what you're saying, attention, drawing attention. So what, what is your suggestion? Like when you started your career and when you see, I, I mean, I'm, I'm this generation and I see that, you know, things are, I feel like a little bit different um, right now than what we, we used to read from, you know, some other people, like successful people's, uh, you know, biography. So what is your take on that? Like, yeah, what, what is your suggestion? You had a question which said policy and politics or policy and poetics? Politics. Politics. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, from uh, forgive me if I haven't understood your question perfectly, but I'll take a run at it. And then if you want, I'll further clarify. So um, first and foremost, um, you know, taking evidence to policy doesn't involve only survey data, confidence intervals, blah, 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 right? The stories are what really matter. So I can remember I there was an op, there was an occasion where we had done some surveys of small uh, micro enterprises in Sri Lanka, India, and Bangladesh, and um, we made a pitch to the big electricity monopoly uh, in Sri Lanka, and um, the guy was yeah. You know, as I said, you know, he's a guy who's sort of interested in things, a reflective practitioner. Uh, I'm still in touch with him. Now he's retired. Uh, he said, hey, this is good stuff, man. Um, though he brought all his people, you know, the top brass. I was joking that if somebody blew up that room that day, we would have no electricity. Uh, everybody was in the room, right? All the additional general managers, deputy general managers, God knows what the hierarchy. And I got one of my uh, colleagues who had been deeply involved in the research to, to do the presentation. And while she was doing it, uh, we had inserted these stories based on qualitative research. So there was this little clip. Uh, it wasn't even a video. It was photographs and text underneath in two languages. Um, which said uh, this young woman uh, who was a beautician uh, running a little little shop uh, out of her home providing beauty care. And she was saying, oh my God, why can't they tell me beforehand when they're cutting the electricity, when they're load shedding? Because that way I can reschedule my, my appointments. Now here, I can't even reschedule because you do it in a random manner. And that means that I don't get the money that they would give me. My income is affected. And then you still expect me to pay the electricity bill at the end of the month. You know, she had this nice little sort of thing. So as we were going through, uh, my friend, uh, the, the, the GM, the general manager, he says, oh, stop, stop that, run that again. Run that again. So that was what really he wanted his senior staff to see that their customers, livelihoods, ability to pay was being affected. It's not the statistics that we were throwing at them. It's the stories. So that's why, I, you know, I, I value, uh, well, learning shares, we value multi-method research. We believe that we have more credibility if we have, uh, you know, science, Science, properly rigorous scientific methods and so on. And, you know, I, I go back to Aristotle in these matters, you know, 
Aristotle talks about ethos, pathos, and logos, right? The standing, the stature, the credibility of the speaker that he or she has developed over the years. That's what university academics sort of come with a free allowance in that department. Um, and then, uh, you know, people like us in the think tanks, we got to really ramp up the, the logos, uh, which is the rationality based appeals, but without the ethos, uh, without the pathos, without the appeal to emotion, we are not going to get anywhere. So it's that combination of the three that actually gets us across the, the line. Uh, and a lot of us don't do that. A lot of academics don't do the pathos part. Uh, but then, you know, if we work in interdisciplinary teams and so on, I think we can we can get the combination. I hope I've answered your question. No, yeah, definitely. I totally agree. Stories matters, but you know, um, um, there is no disagreement with that. But you know, something or you know made me worried about like when I, because you're talking about microcredit, and probably you know about Dr. Yunus, like he was a very famous person. I'm saying was because he's not any more famous person to to Bangladesh, especially Bangladeshi government right now, and that's because uh, you know. He's not <laughs> uh, with the politics and then political party. Oh, that part. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm saying like that there is a power relation, right? That the researcher, I mean, knowledge is not neutral right now. Um, and knowledge cannot create a shared reality. That's the problem we are living at this you know, era. Um, yeah, I, I know. I mean, I followed uh, Yunus's uh, life. Uh, how he got in the gun sites of Hasina and so on. Um, that happens, but I think uh, people, researchers can navigate that better than, you know, he's, he's not just, I mean, he's not a researcher anymore. I mean, I know he started off as an academic, but he's not a researcher, he's an entrepreneur. Uh, and entrepreneurs, uh, especially powerful entrepreneurs have difficulty with politicians you know, what Putin is throwing people through windows these days, uh, right? Um, so no, uh, but I think, you know, I mean, I think people like Dilshan know, I'm, I'm a controversial guy, but you know, it doesn't matter which, and, and people think, you know, I'm aligned with sort of more sympathetic to one side or not, but I still get phone calls from the guys on the other side, right? Because they know that I'm not consistent, I'm not a party line guy, right? I may be more sympathetic to a certain way of running the country and certain kind of politics, but I'm not aligned with a political party. Uh, and I don't have that bigger power base like uh, Yunus saw in my country, uh, Sarodeya's boss, Ari Ratna had, uh, because he also got on the gun sites of the, the government and, and experience all sorts of difficulties. I think academics can, can navigate that. One of the best, uh, uh, best uh, certificates I got was one of my colleagues had met some people from the president's secretariat in a foreign country. This was uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa's heyday when he was right at the top of his game. And they have said, oh, you're with Samaraji. We don't know whether he's against us or with us. So I thought, now that's really where I want to be, where they don't know whether I'm with them or not, not or against them. That's the ideal uh, position for, for us to be in. Thank you so much, Dr. Samaraji. Well, like we are about four minutes about uh, the uh, time, but how I have a burning question uh, to get your view. Uh, when it comes to national security policies, uh, whichever the color of the government that comes into power, they cannot do nothing with those policies. But when it comes to environmental policies, I'm particularly, I'm, I'm focusing on climate change related policies. Every color of the government comes, they flip flop. But when it comes to natural security policies, no government can penetrate and do any changes to the natural, uh, uh, national security. So why we can, like some of the environmental policies related to climate change, I mean, that's a reality. We see a lot of devastation due to climate change. Why is that we have not yet 
put some of the salient environmental policy that directly has an influence on common people like you and me into a category of policies where whichever the color of the government that comes into power, they cannot change that rather than going flip flop. Like we see in US and other countries, you know, one government comes, they go pro climate change policies, then other com government comes and undo all the pro climate change policies. What, what is your view? I think it's a wicked problem. There is this category of public policy problems called wicked problems, where, you know, whatever you do, you're going to piss off somebody. And, and the information, however much we uh, in the academy think the information is solid. Uh, in fact, uh, there are problems with the information. So just take, I mean, Canada will go and make all sorts of wonderful speeches about climate change, but they're doing oil sands. <laughs> And they won't, they won't back off on that because that's really what keeps Alberta going. And if Alberta goes flips the other way, the Liberal Party will lose the entire Western uh, Canadian vote and so on and so forth, right? I mean, you are, you, we know what the politics of this game is, right? Um, so uh, short-term gains, long-term costs, those are never easy to reconcile. So, so much so that in the, the environment that we are in, in Sri Lanka, where we are rethinking everything uh, because of this uh, mad uh, situation that uh, our government put us into, they basically took our economy and drove it off the cliff. Um, we're thinking that uh, maybe some of the things that have been done in uh, places like France and Ireland, which is to take a random sample of citizens, um, I mean, do it in a sort of constitutional manner, random sample of citizens, create something like a jury, a public, uh, what we call a uh, public assembly, people's assembly, uh, where they will function as a jury and they will be, people will with different views. You know, the guys who want uh, climate change to be given absolute priority over economic development or poverty alleviation, uh, all the, and the people who are, uh, hold the diametrically opposite views to make presentations to this jury. And the jury will, will come up with some conclusions. And maybe we'll run that through a referendum or something that, like that and solidify it. Um, I would invite you to take a look at what's, uh, what Macron has done with regard to uh, climate change, not very successful. And look at what uh, Ireland did with regard to abortion uh, highly successful. So think about some of those. We may not be able to do this through the conventional procedures. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think uh, there, there is a question from Sharada, I think, but uh, since we are running out, our next yeah. session starts at 11.15. Sarada will hold on to that question and uh, uh, maybe Dr. Samarajiva can answer that later. Thank you very, very much for coming. I know it's a bit uh, late in the, oh, not late in the evening. I think it's about, uh, yeah, around 8.30 or so in Sri Lanka. Thank you so much for allocating your time, Dr. Samarajiva, and for the excellent uh, insight into how to handle policy change, um, utilizing the think tank uh, and their abilities to influence uh, political change and, and policy change. Thank you very much. It's, it was a pleasure to listen to you. Thanks. Bye.